So today my session is about the creative industry and sustainable development and how we can use our talent and our skill in creating a more sustainable future. And for me, I'm going to sort of just share a story um, with you guys and let you know just how I came into feeling like, okay, fine, I'm a part of this movement towards um, the sustainable goals. So last year, I happened to be nominated to attend the Goalkeepers Summit. And when I got the letter of invitation from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I was a little bit in shock because I didn't understand why I was being nominated. I didn't feel like I'd done any work towards the SDGs. You know, I just felt like, well, I'm just a singer and I'm just an actress. I'm just an entertainer. I'm not really you know, on the ground running, I'm not an activist, I'm not doing anything on the ground that would show that I am working towards the sustainable, sustainable development goals. And it's so interesting that today we had a session on imposter syndrome, because that's one of the things I started to feel like, are they sure? Is it me? Did they really want me? Or, you know, did I receive this email by mistake? Maybe they meant someone else. Maybe they know something else about me that maybe they got that information by mistake. And then um, to attend the summit, you had to apply for sponsorship for your travel and accommodation expenses. And initially I was like, you know what, I, can, I, don't, I don't need the sponsorship. I think I'll be able to take myself. And a friend of mine said, no, Patricia, um, if there's a space for you and there's funds to take you there, just apply. I applied and unfortunately I didn't get sponsorship, but I said, it, it's fine. I can pay for my own travel, I can pay for accommodation, but that rejection of the sponsorship um, proposal sort of fed into my imposter syndrome because I was like, okay, I guess they can see now, okay, she's not the one, she's not the one, we don't feel like it's worth it to support her, but I just said, you know what, let me go, there's lots to learn, I want to, you know, feel plugged in, let me see what it's about. So I went to the the summit and it was such an interesting experience because people from all over the world who had been nominated as well and whose stories I was listening to, watching, learning what people were doing were so impressive because people around the world, young, old, same age as me, peers, where it felt like there was so much going on and people were really plugging into this actionable goals and I felt like, wait, I really don't belong here. <laughs> and so my imposter syndrome just kept, it kept feeding into that. And I remember at the last session where they were awarding um, their, you know, the, they have these award ceremony right at the end. I remember even bursting into tears and crying because in that moment I felt for the most part, like I did not belong there at all. And I really questioned, why would I be nominated? I think the person made a mistake and I remember they came up to me to say hello and I couldn't even look them in the eye because I just felt so embarrassed and so ashamed like these people are going to see they've seen that I'm a fraud I'm, I'm just here and I shouldn't be here and I remember um, I was there with my friend Sharon and she'd also been nominated as well and she got sponsorship and you know I felt like you deserve to be here and I don't on the trip back home, I had to reflect a lot on what I had learned while at the summit, because while I still felt this way, I did attend a lot of sessions that taught me so much. And one of the sessions that was really eye-opening was talking about bias and how people the world over have biases that they may not realize, whether it's biases towards women and what they should be, whether it's biases towards black people and who they think they should be. And I realized that I had created a bias against myself, that because I'm an entertainer, that my work is not as important as somebody who's on the ground, maybe running an organization that supports women and children or people who are doing things for the community in terms of hygiene or people who are creating opportunities for children who don't have access to food to have lunch in school, such as Wawera Njiru, you know? So, I started to think, why am I so biased against myself? And I reflected upon that and I realized that in my work over the years, as much as I had studied 
first of all at Moi University. Hey, I'm an alumni. <laughs> University and um, I was in the School of Social Sciences and my major was psychology. I didn't end up practicing psychology because I was interested in consumer psychology and marketing and how we can influence ideas. But I also delved into the work of entertainment as a singer, as an actress, as a radio presenter who loves to champion for, for Kenyan artists. And I realized that one, the, the degree that I studied psychology has actually impacted my work over the years so much because I came to understand marketing in a different way, which feeds into my content creation and how I get to collaborate with brands in a creative way. Two, my work in radio, which was to sort of find underground artists who make amazing music but don't necessarily get the airplay that I felt they deserved. I had a platform where I could champion their music. I had a platform on YouTube that I created and on Instagram where I could play and feature artists from Kenya who make amazing music and give them a chance to be discovered by people who wouldn't know that their music existed because they weren't getting airplay. I realized that in my work championing for Kenyan brands and made in Kenya clothes, jewelry, makeup, like today I'm just dressed in made in Kenya everything. There's a t-shirt I have on, I don't know if you can see. It says Kenyan, made of nyamchom, great, great tea and rich history. Um, the work that I do in championing all these Kenyan brands, before I used to feel like it's just cause I love Kenyan brands and Kenyan music and Kenyan artists and Kenyan literature. But later on my way back while I was reflecting on all of this, I realized that my work has given people who would not have been found out or discovered a place to have fans, to have people who know them, people who can then put money back into them by paying for their concerts, buying their products, buying the clothes, and this then solidified and validated that being an artist in Kenya, if you have people championing your work, then people will be able to spend money on what it is that you create, what it is that you put out, and therefore artists are then able to, to create for themselves decent work. And I realized that for me also as an artist and as I used to say that, I'm the biggest fan, like I can make a living out of being the biggest fan. <laughs> and I realized that even with creating a platform such as Speakerbox in collaboration with K1, where we then took the artists that I would play on Afro Central, my radio show, to have a platform where they can actually play live. People can come and watch them play for, for free, but the artists, we do pay the artists. It's also giving them a platform to make money from their art. And by the time I got home, I realized that work towards sustainability or a sustainable future doesn't have to look a certain way. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to have a nine to five. You don't have to create an organization that like an NGO or, you know, be out in the world with your fist in the air. That is all amazing, but you can also in your own little way with whatever talent that you have, that voice that you have is valid, it is important, it is impactful and it is needed. So by the time I got back home, I realized that one, yes, SDG eight is the most aligned to what I do because I feel like championing for people who don't have the eyeballs once we put eyeballs on people, then they're able to make money and have decent work and make a living and be able to say, yo, I'm an artist, I'm a YouTuber, I'm an Instagrammer, I create content, I create music, I write films, I write books, and they're able to say, and I make a good, decent living from it. And so what I want to say is that your talent and your skill, whatever that is, First of all, it was given to you for a reason. There's a reason that those are the things you're interested in. There's a reason that those are the things that you're talented at. And if we, if we are able to validate 
every single person so that you don't feel like because I'm not using my degree or because I didn't finish university, then I'm not as important as somebody who did. As long as you have something that you find useful, that you're good at, that is the thing that you're supposed to do. And that is the thing that you will be passionate about. That is the thing that you will wake up every single morning excited to do. Yes, it will be hard work. There's, there's this saying that people say that if you do something that you love and enjoy that, then you'll never work a day in your life. But actually you will work and you'll probably work harder, but you will be more passionate about it. And you will find that you will reach that self-actualization because you are doing the thing that you are purposed to do. And so, using your talent and skill in the work towards the sustainable development goals it can be in anything it doesn't have to be subscribing to a certain box or to a certain label the creative industry is filled with all sorts of people jewelry makers clothes makers music literature movies anything that means that you're creating something from nothing is a creative industry and if you think about it right now during COVID-19 and the lockdowns and people having to stay home, there's so many avenues of entertainment that they've had to turn to, whether it's YouTubers, whether it's content from movies, TV series, music, all these things are from the creative industry and they have really helped people tide over these times. If you think about a world without music, if you think about a world without acting, if you think about a world without cell phones, cell phones and how we use them, the user design is created by someone. So even tech, even fashion, beauty, all these things are from the creative industry and they're the things that help drive us forward because if we think of a world without them, we, <laughs> we're really bored. <laughs> We really can't, you know, explore the other side of our of us. And for some of for some of us, this is the side. So I think if we get to validate everybody who's interested in the creative industry without making them feel like it's just a hobby and you have to do something more serious, if we're able to validate our children, our young nieces and nephews, anybody who's younger than us, and tell them that whatever it is that you want to do that's creative is important. And you can use that to share messages across society, whether it's teaching, whether it's entertaining, whether it's inspiring, motivating, all these things are a huge part of the creative industry. And I think that once we validate people in their work in the creative industry, then we empower them to be economically independent. And once one person has economic strength, so does the next and the next. And that just results in a country, especially for us in a developing country, we're able to play a part in also the economic growth of the country um, from the creative industry. So that's what I had to say to you guys today that the creative industry, it plays a huge role in sustainable development and a sustainable future. And I'm so happy that I'm a part of it. Thank you. <laughs> That's really amazing. Your story is so powerful. It's, yeah, it is. So now um, I have one question. As I wait for the delegates to send in their questions, um, yeah, so now my question would be, with the creativity industry, I do know it needs a lot of consistency in as much as when you start off, things might feel like they're not paying off and there's a way you can connect creativity and still have um, sustainability um, connected. And so I have also been seeing your vlogs. Um, you've, you've been talking about consistency and trying to also keep up with probably creating content weekly or as often as vloggers should. So what do you have to say to anyone who's probably not um, just struggling with being consistent in whatever they're doing? I think one of the things I'm learning right now is the, if you do one thing, then you want to do the next. So for me, um, yes, I do struggle with consistency and that's because I'm a huge procrastinator and that's because I'm just driven by perfectionism, which as you heard is one of the, is one of the different types of imposter syndrome, right? So it's this need to be perfect and I'm not allowing myself the journey to growth. So 
what I have found in the last couple of months is the when I put up the first video, I was motivated to put up the second. So it took a while to work on the second and the second came up after a month. But then after that, it took me three days to put up the next. And then after that, I'm working on having the next one up today. So the motivation of publishing, to hit publish and say, I did it, is what is driving me to do the next thing. And so if you're struggling with consistency, find that thing that motivates you. If it's that feeling of accomplishment, then work towards that. Because once you hit publish, then you're able to do the next and give yourself room to grow. Sometimes it's really important that we set realistic expectations, right? So initially I was like, I'm coming back to YouTube. I'm going to put up three videos a week and I'm going to be consistent. I had to just take a chill pill and say, okay, Patricia, let's see, <laughs> let's see what would be a realistic, a realistic um, consistency goal. So if it's once a week, let's work with that and then add on to that as I'm going because I'm learning how to set a routine of creating content and I'm learning how to batch shoot and to shoot multiple videos on the same day and sort of make them so that I'm able to edit, schedule, upload and then it'll just go on whatever date I've set it to go live and yeah so that's the thing that I'm doing and this week I have to say that feeling of accomplishment I put up a video last week Thursday I put up another one uh, this week Tuesday I've been so amped to put up the next one so just do it just start and then just keep going track your goals track the things that you're doing your results and then work with that so that you're able to set realistic expectations Okay, so I'll go to the chat box and the first question I got was um, where like, where did you get the, the t-shirt from? Yeah, where is the t-shirt from? So the t-shirt is by Too Early for Birds. If you've heard of Too Early for Birds, uh, they're the production company that put up these amazing plays that tell the history of Kenya. So if you go to the Too Early for Birds Twitter or Instagram, you'll find details on how to get the t-shirt. Can you hear me or is, am I yeah, the yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, <laughs> okay. So Too um, Early for Birds are the guys who are selling the t-shirts. Okay, um, the next question is, how does oh, 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 like how does she achieve? Okay, how do you achieve a balance in doing all those forms of art? And also, um, are you releasing a song? Because we've missed <laughs> listening to songs and hearing you sing. Uh, thank you so much. Let me answer the song question first. So um, when it comes to music, that one is still something that I'm working on. Um, so whenever people ask, I like to say in God's time, <laughs> but I think this is the year where we can't really say what's going on, what's happening, but I am definitely planning on delving back into music. That's definitely something that I'm going to do. When it comes to balancing all the things that I do for me, it's because they're all intertwined. They all sort of just, you know, my love for music, my love for performance, my love for gigs, my love for YouTube. All these things are, are intertwined. So I feel like they feed into each other. So I don't have to look at them as separate things. They're all just parts of each other. And that's why I'm able to do all of them. And also because I enjoy them. So it's not so hard to do something. Else. Okay. Um, the next question is um, from, okay. You had touched on bias and there's a lot of bias against Kenyan and African entertainment as a whole whereby most people prefer Western entertainment which they believe to be better. How can we shift this mentality and get more young Kenyan people to embrace Kenyan and African entertainment? I think to be honest it's true because we were brought up only consuming Western media because we didn't have um, we didn't have an influx, you know, like Western media already had a rich history in creating content. So by the time we were young, I'm 34 years old. So in 1990, when KTN started, a lot of the TV shows were, were from America. They were Western because here we didn't, we had maybe one or two, we had the Vitimbis and we had the Viojama Kamani, but we didn't have a full day's worth of content that could have 
presided over Kenyan TV. So even when it came to music, we didn't have a plethora of artists who are making videos for us to consume. I do think things have changed now. And just because we are, uh, we're behind Western media doesn't mean that we're not heading in the right direction. So one of the ways that we as Kenyans can change that mindset is we need to support our own. We need to dig deeper and find these artists who are making amazing music, amazing music that can rival any music from around the world. The content coming out of Kenya and Africa is fantastic. And I think the rest of the world has realized that. And it's unfortunate that we had to start to appreciate ourselves because the West did. But I think we can forgive ourselves for that and now put more work and effort into supporting our own, appreciating our own. It's no longer about supporting because you're Kenyan. It's supporting because we're Kenyan and we are good. So be on the lookout, keep your eyes out for emerging artists, emerging filmmakers, documentary makers, content creators, they're there. If you need help, you can come to my platforms. I'm sure you'll discover somebody new. You'll discover um, new brands, new artists, new musicians. And yeah, you can find more people who are putting that kind of work out. So it's up to us. And I think we're, we're definitely on the right path. OK. Um, the next question, um, give me a second. Now that you are a huge brand ambassador for Kenyan brands, do you vibe with all or just some? Also, have you dismissed some Kenyan brands that wanted to work with you? So what I also try to advocate for is authenticity. So I advocate for, you know, music that I like, um, clothing that I like that I would wear, um, quality that I would then, you know, speak about and say, this is a good brand. This is something you should, you should get because I trust the brand. So I think a lot of people just assume that because I said, yeah, you know, I'm all for Kenyan brands. Someone can come to me with something that is not necessarily the best quality and it wouldn't be in my best interest to advocate for something that I feel like probably they didn't put out as much work or thought in, or thought into. So yes, I'm an advocate for made in Kenya brands. Yes, I'm an advocate for made in Kenya artists and literature and whatnot. But at the same time, I do you know, have my tastes. It's not skewed towards preference of the people. It's just skewed towards my preferences based on if you like R&B, you like R&B. If you like hip hop, you like hip hop. And I feel like that's something that I strive to do as well so that people don't just feel like they can't trust the things that I am supporting or endorsing, um, but we have so many amazing brands. There are some brands that, yes, I, have, I haven't necessarily put the word out, but one of the things that I also don't do is I don't talk badly about a brand if it's Kenyan. Basically, I'll give my feedback to the brand and say, hey, I love where you're going. I love what you're doing. Maybe you could work on this to improve the quality or to improve the, the what's the word? The word is running away from me again, <laughs> the delivery, <laughs> so that um, I can then endorse it to people and people can trust that I am endorsing something that is quality, something that is worth their while to spend money on. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's so many questions. Um, so the next one is, when someone is looking to get into creation, is it necessary to use your actual name or are stage names or nicknames still marketable? You can do whatever you want. Do whatever is comfortable for you. At the end of the day, you are giving us yourself. So you have to give us that thing that you're comfortable giving so that you're able to sustainably continue doing it. You don't want to be inauthentic to yourself. So if you want to use your real name, go ahead. If you feel like a stage name better represents you, that's absolutely fine as well. Uh, there's really no rules to it. You make your own rules. And at the end of the day, it's you that you're giving us. So give us the you that you want us to have. Okay. The other one, do you ever critique your own work whatsoever? Yes, all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Even now, I'm still watching my YouTube videos to see what I can do better. And I think that's a part of the journey. Um, it's not 
just the same way you're, you, you have to be able to distinguish between constructive criticism and destructive criticism, I am learning to not beat myself up for not doing things the way I want them to be. Because I also have to, you know, I have these Steven Spielberg expectations of myself, but I'm just Patricia Kihoro. So if I watch my video and I'm like, ah, I wish it looked like Casey Neistat's video. Casey Neistat put a lot of work and effort and years into his content. And I have to allow myself the same grace to grow in the way that he did. Maybe my pace might be different. I might grow faster. Right now, a lot of the things I do are self-taught. So just allowing, you have to allow yourself the grace and that's what I'm learning to do as well. Not to beat myself up, but to constructively criticize myself as well and be like, okay, here I could have done this better. Here I could have improved on this or, okay, so I get the challenges I faced here and this is how I can overcome them. So yeah, I do criticize, but I'm learning to constructively criticize myself. Okay, the other question is what inspires your creativity? My life, my life inspires my creativity. At the moment, yeah, everything I'm doing, even my work with um, brands, when it comes to collaborating and creating content in partnership with brands, it's really, it's something that I've, I've learned to have to put my, my foot down um, and say, my content is not based on your product, it's based on my life and how your product fits into my life. So my creativity is basically inspired by life, the people in my life, the things I experience, the things that I do, the things that I watch, just life. Travel, oh, travel, I miss travel, but yeah. <laughs> okay, now in line with that also, how were you able to figure out your own brand? I, I think I'm just, I don't, I'm just myself, to be honest. I don't, I don't look at myself as a brand, but I do know that there's a Patricia Kihara brand that people experience. But honestly, I'm just myself. As, okay. Like, yeah, I'm just myself. Um, someone else asked, how do you start with little to no capital for production? Um, I would ask, I don't know what they mean by production. I don't know what they mean by production. What, what do they mean by production? Mm, okay. Give me a second. I think the question was from Mudoni Mwangi. So kindly elaborate what you meant by production. Yeah. Oh. I am not sure if you can hear me. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So by production is since given that Patricia, you do music on the side as well. So my question would be, how do you how do you start given you have no zero to no capital at all? And you want to probably say produce your own music and all that. Okay, so <laughs> I've only ever done one song <laughs> that's on radio. Um, <laughs> and I think if you have no capital, what I would advise is probably collaborate. Collaborations right now are how people are getting a lot of things done. So speak to a producer and say, you know, this is our arrangement. I don't have any money because a lot of people do that. It's not money exchanging hands all the time. You can come and say, this is what I have. This is a talent that I have. I'd like to produce a song with you. And then you talk about splitting the rights and the ownership. Um, that's what a lot of people do. So to be honest, money as a form of currency is not necessarily the most important thing when it comes to creating any kind of content such as music or TV or film. It's basically leveraging on what skills you have and how you can do a buck of those skills to bring something to life. And most people right now, collaborations are, are the way to go. Ah, okay, so oh. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, the other question, okay. Whoa, there's so many questions. In terms of content, do you think youths are more of consumers than creators and how, okay. And how can we go about it? I think it should be go. I think, I think there's definitely, usually, I think in any market, the consumers are usually more than the creators. 
So yeah, I, f I do feel like we have more consumers that, than we have creators and that's okay. I think that's an okay thing. Okay. There's nothing to change there. And if it does change, if it does get to a point where we have an equal number of creators and consumers, and that's great. And if it gets to a point where we have more creators and consumers, then that's okay, because you can also be a creator and a consumer at the same time. Like I create content for YouTube and Instagram, but at the same time, I also love and watch a lot of other YouTubers. I follow a lot of other Instagrammers. So it doesn't mean that because you're a creator, you don't shut yourself off. There's, there's always, you know, we're doing both. Yeah. Okay. The other question is, what do you feel about the notion that only light-skinned actors are, are going to make it to the industry and darker persons, especially women, won't go far? Oh, okay. mm -hmm. So there definitely has been a history of colorism around the world, not just in America or Western countries, even here. Um, colorism has been something that's been so deeply ingrained in us. And it's interesting, even today, Yesterday, I was just thinking about it. Even when you're looking for a filter on your Instagram, you'll notice that if you're dark skinned, the filters basically just make you lighter. There's none that can honor the integrity of the melanin in your skin. And to be honest, I think we're in a space where we have women who are coming out and championing darker skinned women. And I feel like a lot of darker skinned women are feeling empowered to say, hey, I've taken this for long enough. I'm a dark skinned woman who is just as talented, maybe even more talented than so-and-so. And to basically make other women of the same complexion feel like, don't, please don't feel like you have to lighten your skin. Please don't feel like you have to buy lighter makeup products because also we've seen that in the way that makeup companies are now being more inclusive and diverse in terms of skin tones. So I think it's important to note that we are at a point where there's a shift and we're starting to recognize that darker skinned is just as beautiful as lighter skinned and the privilege of light skin is, is also starting to be called out and people are becoming more and more aware that this was actually a thing that was plaguing us for the very longest of times. Yeah, so we, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction, yeah. You have muted yourself, I can't hear you. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Always forget. So now people are asking, since Gengetone is a new wave of music, yeah, mm -hmm. what do you think about, like, what's your, what's your, what's your take on that kind of music right now? I think Gengetone is dope. Like Gengetone is another genre that we can enjoy. Um, the people who love it, love it. I have listened to some Gengetone jams and I have jammed to them. So I think Gengetone is amazing. And I think the order of the world is that new things come up all the time and new things are attractive. They are things that we gravitate towards. And I want to say that let's honor that you know these are these are the gengeton artists are also creating something out of their own experiences out of their own tastes and if we love it we love it if there's people who have different tastes that's completely fine a genre coming up doesn't mean another ha has to be diminished you know just because gengeton gengeton is great right, right now and people are loving it doesn't mean that genge itself or um new nairobi or whatever people are calling everything else is now having to go down all these genres can exist um, at par and we can love as many as we want. Just because you love one genre doesn't mean you can't explore another. So I don't think anything has to be pitted against each other. Gengeton is dope and I love it and I enjoy it. And, you know, great job to all the Gengeton artists. Okay, so we are five minutes past time. I'd like us mm -hmm. to probably finish at that. And then all the other questions that have been sent, um, we will probably direct them to your DM on Instagram and then probably you can do a story maybe answering questions because we're not able to finish uh, like on all questions right now because our other speaker is here, if that's fine by you. That's okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask Max to, Max, do you have any other question or anything to say? Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, maybe it is just fair that we plug in our viewers from youtube and there is a question from youtube by mm -hmm. tina is my name 
and she's asking you, Patricia, as a multi-potentialite. Wow, that's a, that's a big name. <laughs> yes. Multi-potentialite. How do you yeah. cater for all your passions? How do you cater uh, for all your passions? Yeah. I have found that all my passions feed into each other. They're all, you know, there's not one that's greater than the other. And if I honor them and give them as much love <laughs> and explore them whenever I feel like it, I don't have to feel like, okay, right now I'm loving music too much. I have to now love YouTube as much. I give them time to shine. Um, you know, there's a time when music will take a back seat and that's okay. I'm still enjoying listening to music. There's a time acting will take a back seat because, you know, maybe the YouTube is thriving at that point. So allowing all of them to just naturally and authentically um, come forward whenever they need to and for me to honor them at my fullest when they do and if they coincide that's absolutely perfect they coincide a lot of times they're concurrent so you don't have to choose one over the other there's a question that people ask all the time okay so you sing and you act and you do radio and you do improv comedy and youtube which one do you love the most and the answer is I love them all. I enjoy them all. And I do them when the need comes, when I feel the need to express myself in either one of them. And they're all just, they're things that feed my soul. And so I'm grateful that I have all these things to feed my soul. Yeah. Amazing. And uh, I think uh, I'd also pose a question to you since you're, uh, you did psychology. Yep. Um, what do you think is the state of mental health for the youth right now? And do you think enough is being done to ensure that uh, the mental state of the youth, especially also in the creative industry, uh, mm -hmm. being uh, aware of the bullying and everything that has been happening? So how do you think uh, this mental health or the mental state of people should be handled moving forward, maybe? I think right now we're at a time, as, again, I'm going to use this word shift. I think I love that we're having more conversations online. I'm seeing more people talking about mental health, mental wellness. And I love that the, the, the stigma around mental health, wellness, I even like to call it mental fitness, is being taken away from these conversations. And people are feeling free and more open to discuss and to know and to realize that it's OK to not be OK. <laughs> And I think awareness is such a big part of learning and of overcoming. So once we realize that one, this is not an issue that means I'm crazy because for the longest time, any time we talked about mental health, you just think, okay, they're, they're, not, they're, they're mad, they're depressed, they're this. And once we realize that there's a scale to things and it's not just black and white, it's not that if you, you're mentally well or you're mentally not. There's a scale to things and, you know, you can be okay today and tomorrow you're not, or something can trigger you. I love that these conversations are being had. I love that people with great platforms, big platforms are having these conversations so that people who felt like, oh, I'm going to keep it to myself because it's not cool or because people will think this. Once they see that, oh, if so-and-so talked about this and that experience that they had is similar to mine, then it's good that I'm one, not alone. Two, I know that it's something that I can handle, I can deal with. It's not that I'm crazy. And three, we're able to share and empower and strengthen each other in these conversations. So I feel like the shift is happening. Not enough is being done, but I'm glad that we're moving in that direction. And I love that people are seeing the importance of having these conversations in open spaces. And I hope and pray that I can also be a part of enabling these conversations to expand and to grow so that we get to a point where, you know, it's completely okay to say, yo, I'm dealing with this or I'm feeling like this and nobody's gonna be like, oh, that's a weirdo. We're gonna just be accepting and we're gonna be accommodating and we're gonna be allowing for healing and growth. So, yeah. yeah. That's amazing, Thank that's amazing, that's so powerful. And lastly, before we let you go, I'm seeing so much black on your background and your t-shirt. What is the color you think about when you think of happiness? Wow, right now, currently, I'm really gravitating towards yellow and orange. Are you sure you're cute? 
are you not Kamba? <laughs> <laughs> but the colors change, you know, I've realized that I go through phases. So this is, these are the colors of today. Tomorrow, I don't know. Half of my house is painted black and I love it so much. So it doesn't mean that I'm dark. It doesn't mean that it's just a preference. Yeah.